Okay, let's well, 10. Let's go ahead and start. Welcome. This is ORI's FPGA meetup where we talk about what we have done and what we plan to do. And um, if we have any roadblocks, anything that's preventing us from, from doing what we uh, aim to do, and uh, if we need any resources. Uh, and I know that, that Paul has a lot to share. Uh, and also, we we're expecting Matthew to join presently. He has a, a hard stop at 1030, so I'm going to let him go first. But in the meantime, uh, welcome to, to Jeremy and, and Ken. Uh, Ken, why don't you start us out and bring us up to date with, with anything that you've managed to do over the past week? It's been an interesting week. Uh, but go ahead and, and tell us your status and, and, what, and your plans. Uh, and then uh, Jeremy will take the floor after that. Yeah, not too much to report. Um, I Paul will probably talk about the uh, Choco Cat here, so I'll defer to that. But uh, yeah, pretty much not not a lot to report. I I I, I can say that uh, from my point of view, it seems like my projects are still they're, they're still there. Um, but that's that's about all I have to say right now. Well, we did work out a channel plan. I still have it on the whiteboard uh, and the, the updated document for that. It's just a one sheet, uh, just a graphic showing the, the the channel mapping and channel plan for Hyferia for the uplink. That's on the, uh, it's in Hyferia Slack channel. So we we did make a little bit of progress there because we figured out, um, you know, how to, how to use the, the current uh, profile and and polyphase filter channelizer, um, and made some decisions about how much space to take up on five gigahertz. So that was some progress. I know that Matthew has a, a hard stop at ten thirty. So so Matthew, whenever you like, you can take the floor, and uh, and present present what you got. All right, very good. Um, let's see. So can I? So can everybody see? Yes. All right. So this this was just kind of a, a proposal for a modem module. Um, and it would have various um, you know, requirements. These probably aren't everything, but data interfaces, uh, processor subsystem, capable of running Linux stack, uh, user. Oh, I kind of repeated there, and then RF interfaces. So the idea is it's a modular platform for experimentation. Um, and so, you know, some use cases, you know, I think it would be, could be really flexible, um, all band, all mode radio. Uh, we just need PA and band filters. You, know, you could use it for a beacon, uh, packet node, uh, self-contained digimode platform. Um, but, you know, here I think, you know, one of the big benefits could be you know, open source experimentation and learning platform. Um, AI, machine learning, new modes, RF design, FPGA design. Uh, all of these things could be implemented on such a platform and not locked into, you know, a particular vendor's uh, tool set or, or design flow. Um, although it wouldn't be exclusive of those. Uh, I think I'll address that in a moment. And so, you know, it could potentially be an off-the-shelf off platform, you know, for... Uh, customers or, or, you know, for, for people that, that wanted to use it for, you know, payloads. Um, although as I proposed it, it, you know, may not be suitable, you know, due to vibration concerns, but you could, it could be respun into uh, something that, that could be used for that. Um, that didn't have plug-in modules, for instance. Um, and it could be, you know, a science platform, atmospheric science, radio astronomy. So I think, any of these things could it could be used for. So here I'm showing a block diagram of it. And so the the main thing here then in the upper middle is is the FPGA. Um, and this would host um, it, it could be any FPGA. And I don't think I mentioned it, um, but it could be like on a little plug-in module. And so you could use different FPGAs. You could use a zinc. Uh, SOC, um, RF SOC, or you could use, um, you know, any, any Xilinx, any Altera, or even some of these new uh, Chinese FPGAs that are coming onto the market. So it, it would provide an opportunity to experiment with different FPGAs. You just have to, you would have to design a new 
plugin module for whatever FPGA you were targeting, but the baseboard wouldn't change. Um, and then, you know, it would have various interfaces uh, to the FPGA audio interfaces um, from a mic or speaker, for example. Um, you could have a USB uh, port that could power the whole thing with a little USB hub that could talk to the system on module or, you know, uh, an audio codec to the FPGA. And then the system on module would have various, you know, interfaces, HDMI, Ethernet, UART, um, for talking to external de uh, devices. And then the here in the middle uh, lower is a system on module. So this would be a plug-in module that would have the entire uh, CPU subsystem. So for example, a Raspberry Pi uh, compute module, uh, CM4, I think, you know, has a, um, a, a SIM or DIM plug-in uh, factor like the old RAM style connectors. And I think NVIDIA uh, Jetson uh, compute modules have a, a um, compatible um, plug-in subsystem. There's probably others on the market. So this this SOM would, would run the Linux uh, subsystem, and then again would have interfaces to all these various other pieces. And so it, you know, it's, it's something that else, because it's a plug-in module, you could swap it out for different modules if you were trying to do different things. The NVIDIA Jetson, for instance, has a lot of, um, you know, it's very focused on, on AI type things. So you'd have uh, compute resources on that module uh, for doing AI uh, act, uh, development, for instance. Um, so, you know, I, I show an SPI interface to the FPGA uh, for configuration and status, and then a data interface, which is a bit non-specified right now. Um, I, I haven't looked in detail at the SOMs and what their data interfaces are available. But, you know, we'd want a high-speed interface here uh, I don't, you know, we could, it could be like a PCIe maybe, or, um, you know, some other Sirdes type interface, or, um, you know, if there was a parallel data interface that might work as well, but I think we get higher throughput with this, with a, a Sirdes uh, type interface. And then lower right would be an RF module. Again, this uh, is envisioned as a pluggable module, and so it could have any RF subsystem that, that we wanted to design a, a plug-in module for. Uh, it, it could use any of the ADI chips that we're working with now, the 9361, or um, I think, I don't remember the part numbers off the top of my head, but any of those um, ADI modules could be used here, or you could implement discrete ADC and DAC and mixers. So any all the RF stuff would be here. And then you'd have obviously, um, TX and RX interfaces, RF interfaces. I show these on the main module, but these are probably actually better on the plug-in module um, so that you don't have to route RF on the on the main board. And then you just need, you know, uh, clocking setups here. So a TCXO um, with a clock generator that would send clocks everywhere. And then we could have a reference clock in and out. It might even be nice to put... Um, a GPS receiver on here, and, and you could even make it a GPS uh, DO um, would actually be nice. Um, so again, you know, you'd have all these these uh, subsystems on on a baseboard with pluggable modules for for some of the subsystems that would allow. You know, again, the idea is that you could use different FPGAs and and try. To, different things and, and workflows with those FPGAs. You could do build new modes. You could build, you know, put Whisper in the FPGA, put FT8 in, in the FPGA, uh, you know, if you were wanting to learn that or try that sort of thing, or it could be the MSK modem, uh, any of those things. And uh, in, in different types of FPGAs, whichever we want. And again, with a very flexible system. So, you know, the, with, except for the SOM, you know, if the FPGA and the RF modules are pluggable, you know, you'd have to design a new module for each different option. Um, but it still gives you the flexibility of, of just focusing on one subsystem. And so you could 
it might be easiest in the beginning to do like an ADI 9361 so that, um, you know, it's something that we're familiar and already using. And then if somebody, you know, wanted a different RF subsystem for some reason, they could do it and still be able to plug it into the same board. Now, you know, the only thing here I would say is if you did use a zinc, you know, it might mitigate, you know, the need for a, a system on module. You know, there might be ways we can bypass some of the stuff out to the to the external ports if somebody was wanting to use a zinc in this case. The the main reason I lean away from the zinc um, is just the cost. I think they tend to be uh, much higher prices compared to um, the more commodity FPGAs. And so if you have the SOM, um, you, you, you're not incurring the additional cost in the FPGA. And again, what is hoped to be a, a fairly low cost experimenting platform. Um, so that was my thinking there. Um, so, you know, again, the processor subsystem, um, you could, again, not have to use the zinc device um, and eliminate the SOM. And then, again, as I, I think I already really covered this, you could use, say, a, a Raspberry Pi CM4, NVIDIA Jetson uh, with AI Compute um, at, for the SOM. So you have, you, if you were wanting something less expensive and didn't need the AI capabilities, the, the Raspberry Pi would be a good choice. Or if you were wanting to experiment with some AI compute, um, against the RF uh, and modem in the FPGA, then the, the Jetson would be a good choice. I think there's others available in the same form factor, um, but I'd, I'd have to do some more research on those. Yeah, like but, like Snapdragon has has really come up quite a bit in in this in this particular category. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So this is the, you know, again, this was just like a view of what the RF module might look like with, you know, so in this case, integrated um, RFIC, uh, like the 9361 uh, or 9371. So you'd have interfaces to the processor, the FPGA uh, data, uh, ref clock, and then the um, RFIF in and out. And then you could have, again, a, a, a less integrated, oh, I didn't change the title, I'm sorry. Um, module where you have discrete ABCs and DACs and mixers and bandpass filters for the IF. Um, so, I mean, it gives you a lot of flexibility in, in trying different architectures and, and using different um, components. And then, you know, if you, you could do an IQ modulator, you know, it's just another example. So you're bringing I and Q onto the RF module. You have an IQ uh, modulator and demodulator. And um, so again, it's just the idea here is you can have a bunch of different RF ar architectures that worked with on the on the same baseboard, and so it gives you an opportunity to experiment with different RF ar architectures. Um, you know, I guess there's some other you know things we could consider going into this. Um, you know, the RFICs you know are are kind of an all-in-one solution. So, you know, it'd be good to support those as I showed in, a pre showed in a previous slide. And then, you know, maybe we want, there's some other things that we want to incorporate, uh, digital pre-distortion, MIMO, other uh, options that, you know, it, especially if they're all contained in on, on an RF module, you could potentially do these um, without any change to the main board. You know, I've done DPD, it, it can be very difficult, I know, that the, some of the ADI devices have uh, DPD in them, um, I, but I haven't looked at those very closely. I've implemented DPD um, with from a third-party vendor and getting the observation path and the, and the algorithms for computing the uh, DPD coefficients was kind of a secret sauce for them. So um, I'm not sure how ADI works. Um, would be interesting to look at. So you need, but the point here, like with DPD, you'd need an extra RF input path for the for the observation. But that again, if all the I, uh, RFIOs are on the plug plug-in board, um, you could do that 
assuming there was a case, you know, we'd probably want to provision some, some, uh, you know, ports or, uh, in the case for additional RFIOs. Um, but you know, as a, if, if a case wasn't being used, then the, this could, you know, you, you can put any IOs on the plugin module that you wanted. Um, Okay, so then this is just a diagram of what the FPGA subsystem would like look, look like. So this is, you know, you'd have the, the audio interfaces, uh, processor interface, SPI control and status. And then, you know, for example, you don't have to do this, but I mean, you could have, oh, I, again, I'm typo here, but, you know, TXFEC modulator, digital uh, DQM, IQ modulation, uh, interpolating, filtering, whatever you need and samples coming out. And then, you know, the reverse path, back um, you could have a soft processor core here to support uh some you know real-time functions within the modem that wouldn't be appropriate for the som and then um you know some rf control status signals going out to the rf plug module um so you know we kind of i think already looked at the at the data interfaces and sample interfaces and um so again in the soft processor core Thinking from an experimental and learning standpoint, you know, it, it, you could put a microblaze on there. You could put a risk five MIPS MSP 430 is is available. Uh, so any any open source core that you wanted could be implemented on the on the the FPGA. Um, and it, again, it would handle any real time control and status of of modem functions, um, so that the SOM didn't have to have a, you know real time operating system. And you know could implement even SDR functions. What would be really interesting, for example, that I, I'd love to play with would be like a Risk Five core with some instruction set extensions that were uh, you know hardware assisted. Um, so you could implement hardware assist to the to the Risk Five core, and I think that would be a really interesting thing to do. And this you know this platform would would offer the ability to do that um, where it might. I mean, you could do it, say, even in the Pluto, but you're limited with, you have limited resources there. I, I, you know, I know there's other platforms that you might be able to play with this on, but um, it, it seems like a, an ideal kind of platform to me for, for doing these kinds of experiments and learnings, learning activities. So in the FPGA, you could do any of the digital processing functions, modems, FECs, DQMs, NCOs, filters, decimation, interpolation, anything that you want to do digitally can be done there. And you could implement analog impairment mitigations, uh, digital pre-distortion, IQ imbalance, DC offset removal. And you could, and we can even build up then a public library of digital modules that could be put into the FPGA. Um, and again, you we wouldn't be tied to particular vendors, you know, tool flows that that can be problematic. This is something that, you know, you could do, use those, they're not precluded, but they're also not required. Okay, so that, that was it. So, I mean, if there's any questions or any any discussion, you know. I, you know yeah, any I think the, the there's an awful lot hiding underneath the public library of digital modules that's very exciting. And I think that we're, we're, we're at the point where, um, where we can start really kind of emphasizing that you know, we've already started publishing some of these uh, potential modules, and like the, I would, I would say like the Cobb's decoder is probably a good one, um, and the DBS2 really, uh, yeah, module. Uh, but both of those are 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 in the right direction. Um, what's lacking so far for these public library of digital modules is like, do we want to like go a little bit further and then, um. It, <laughs> We don't want to over abstract because we talked about suffering from you know from too much abstraction and too much mechanism. But but when we when we talk about publishing uh, like a library of digital modules, do we just want to publish the the code here? It is documented as best we can, or do we want to provide some sort of tackle script that lets you loop it all together in in our particular hardware? In other words, do we want to go a little bit down the path that that ADI does with their uh, hardware? HDL reference designs. It would. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I, but I, I think, I think one doesn't exclude the other. They're, I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. I think we do want to publish kind of the code as is, but yeah, be nice then to have 
a, a, you know, some tickle scripts that could be used to, you know, tie things together. Maybe um, a sub-module approach might work. There. Yeah, I, I, I forget. I'm very, I, I, I like the use of sub-modules and, mm -hmm. and yeah, you can use scripts to pull those out. But I mean, you could even potentially, it would be nice and we could, you know, provide some example scripts, but you could, if you had some tickle scripts that say um, assembled, you know, those components into a functional modem and of yeah. some sort. And, and so then, you know, people could look at that and understand, you know, and figure out, you know, to write their own tickle scripts that, that generated a, a design. Um, okay. No, this sounds exciting. I, that's, I think that's the, yeah, and having any opportunity to play around with Risk Five more, and I really like the idea of the hardware accelerated extensions. Like an opportunity to be able to exercise those is great because there's not that many opportunities to do it. I think I have one dev board, either from Hacker Boxes or somebody else, that that promised kind of a Risk Five experience, but it's um it's very limited. So they didn't give you a lot of room to to kind of um, work it and so very kind of similar to like when, when we the we rely on the Pluto a lot in the lab and really like targeting it because it's a, a real SDR uh, but the limitations of the 7010 or it's a small it's a small FPGA so it's, it's almost like what you're what you've got here is the is the sort of the the thing that should come after the Pluto it it looks like this is the next uh, an evolution of that particular, maybe it's more experimental educational hardware that allows you a lot of flexibility, um, e maybe even more so than the, than the Pluto, because I mean you're, it, it looks like that you have an interface focus. So these are interfaces that you can you can customize. It, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, you don't want a lot of RF here. I think, you know, the RF module is fine, but I mean, you know, I don't necessarily want to put PAs and band filters here. Right. You know, you know, the, yeah, the... yeah. The back plane should be the back plane. And like you're you've got the you've got things cut up and divided up in in, in a way where you can have you can really have a RF module. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot of designs that kind of promise that, but then they put all of the they put they put a lot of RF actually on the the main board, which yeah kind of defeats the purpose. Right. Yeah, I mean, because you know, even with this, you I mean you could just connect the RF output to the to the RF input and and run it as a loopback, if nothing else, for for experimentation. Yeah. One of, one of the things about the FPGA submodule is you know some of these new Chinese FPGAs ha um, have a complete open source tool flow. Yeah. Um, you know, so they again, I feel like something like this makes it more accessible to people. I mean, I could see colleges and universities, you know, using something like this in their courses. Um, and, you know, if, if, you know, vibration concerns could be addressed, maybe we could, you know, be able to lock the modules down such that, you know, vibration isn't as much a concern. It could be, you know, it could be a payload module, um, you know, size, you know, with some consideration. Yeah. Or, or we, we'd get it, or if we were happy with the, the functionality, then it could be packaged for, as a, as a one U card yeah and you could re yeah you could respin the fpga and the som and everything onto the main board so that there wasn't any um yeah you know, you'd have less vibration concerns right cool um, all right that's awesome all right so i know that i know that you have uh, a a stop coming up so that your, your time's a little limited so I, I wanted to invite anybody else here uh to to ask questions and and expand on um on the presentation I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any place for in your block diagram for the audio codec opus for opulent voice, for instance. Um, in that, so, okay. I mean, so the, I have two audio codecs in the diagram with the external, you know, RJ forty five for a mic and a eighth inch TRS for a speaker. So that I mean, makes it look like a hardware module, though, and the modern codecs are not generally hardware modules or software um uh, well i mean like i you know like the cm 108 you know uh that's pretty popular you could do something like that i was thinking i'm and not familiar with that device but at least 
we want to be able to experiment with software-based vocoders like like Opus. So uh, audio I path mean, into the. I don't think that's excluded. I mean, you could you could you have the data path through USB. I, I think we're probably needing some more USB ports potentially, but you could you could. The idea here was um, that yeah, we could do audio over the USB through the hub to an uh, you know a dedicated audio codec, or you could take the data into the SOM and implement um, you know software codecs on the SOM and then be able to send them to the FPGA via the data interface. So I, I don't think a, a software codec is precluded here. I think it's it would be entirely feasible. I mean, I, there's wouldn't probably... be able to do it through the connected microphone and speaker jacks. Uh, no. Okay, but yeah, that's that maybe a good point. We could, um, you know, yeah, we could add another audio codec, or we could. I'm sure we could do something so we could connect that uh, speed if into the into the SOM as well from the from the jacks. Maybe like some jumpers so that you could send it to the FPGA or you could send it to the SOM. So that, that's a good point. I, I see your point. And yeah, that that's not something I'd considered, but it, it's not. I mean, there's there's probably a lot of adjustments to this block diagram before something was implemented. What was the name of the audio codec you were talking about so I can look it up? Uh, CM108. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a number of them, but that's one that's really popular in a lot of the... Um, little like dongles that you, you get for uh, ham radio. Um, you see that one all the time. All right. Yeah, and then there's a there's the other one that we have a little bit of experience with on the porta pack. It's not a CM108, but it's a, I think it starts with a W, but we, we dug into that because we, we debugged um, some FM audio issues with the configuration of the of the hardware codec on the porta pack and uh, helped out a little bit there. So there, there are a couple of them that are that come up in the in designs pretty consistently that are the sort of the go to hardware codecs, um, you know. But sorting out the paths, allowing there to be a software and a hardware path is is a good uh, good point. Yeah. Cool. This is right. this is great. No, I'm I'm excited. Um, let's see. And I wrote down. Yeah, DPD. There are there is DPD. Um, on board the RFICs that we've been working with from ADI. We haven't done much with it. And another uh, person in, in ORI that's worked with DPD uh, took an AI ML approach to DPD, and that's Charles Brain. Uh, so it, you'd have to scroll back up in the AI channel a little bit. Um, but that was uh, something he dug into and, and, and looked at. Uh, and it's a it's a area of broad interest and in, in research out there, um, you know, improving you either using ML for, for DPD or just trying to get it to, to work best. And I think your, your comment about it, uh, being, uh, a little mysterious, I think you said it's a little, could, yeah, it's a, but this is, this would be a nice platform to experiment with DPD and develop algorithms. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, it would. I mean, the D, the DPD itself is, is, entire is very simple it's just complex multipliers um but yeah, assuming you're an iq space but um it, it's the you know taking the observation data in and determining you know what what the distortions are and yeah and, and correcting those distort or you know and computing the coefficients that you need to to correct those distortions so that's yeah really where the 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 work is and you know i don't know what adi is doing but again to me that this would be a neat platform, you know, to experiment and you could de and develop algorithms and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, it's built into the profile. So the profile that we create with TES um, and and load up in, in the um, in the chip, uh, some of the assumptions for the observation receiver, uh, some of those things are obviously intended to allow for for DPD. So you can see that that's kind of in the fabric. Um, yeah. They assume that you'll probably want to leverage it and and put it into the the rules of thumb or the heuristics for the profile generation. We haven't really exercised it, but it's there. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. All right. Any any last uh last comments for Matthew? All right. Thank you so much. And I I know you have to to depart. Um, yeah. But this is this is wonderful. And let's go ahead and and circulate the. The, uh, the slide deck out uh, to the community and see if we can get some some additional feedback and 
and uh, start talking about maybe next steps. Very good. All right. Thanks. You bet.